Hi there, I'm Dr. Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. Effect modification and confounding can be confused with each other. In this video, I'll give you two methods that you can use to differentiate confounding and effect modification. So let's start out with a little pretest and um, see what you already know. So this is a table I adapted from the BMJ that looked at various risk factors. In this case, I limited it to rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and their effect on herpes zoster. And the authors looked at different age strata to see if it had a differential effect on the association between rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and herpes zoster. So I want you to think about is age an effect modifier, a confounder, or neither of the associations between rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Pause the video, think about it, then restart it, and we'll go through it, and in the end, we'll see how I answer it. So pause the video now. So first, let's focus on confounding. So confounding is distortion of the true effect of exposure on disease by some third factor. And it can lead to over or underestimation of the true effect. So let's look at a potential association between hormone replacement therapy and cardiovascular disease. And we're going to think about whether smoking could be a confounder. So for smoking to be a confounder, it has to meet three criteria. Number one, it has to be associated with the outcome of interest. And we certainly know smoking is. It has to be associated with the exposure of interest. And you usually see that it will be, or it has to be, unequally distributed between the unexposed and the exposed people. But it can't just be a link in the causal chain from exposure to disease. And clearly, hormone replacement therapy doesn't go through smoking to explain cardiovascular disease. So smoking could be a confounder. But effect modification is very different. We really need to differentiate confounding and effect modification. Now, effect modification occurs when varying levels of a third variable, and that's the key, varying levels, um, have an effect on the effect of the exposure on disease. So the key here is varying levels, whereas in a confounder, we won't see that difference of varying levels. So for example, if we want to think about whether age is a, an effect modifier of the effect of smoking on lung cancer, we would look at different age groups, and it makes sense that smoking in a 20-year-old compared to a 40-year-old compared to a 7-year-old would have a differential effect on lung cancer. So in this case, age would be an effect modifier of the association of smoking and lung cancer. Now often you'll see the term interaction used um, to explain effect modification. And there are different concepts. So effect modification is truly a biological phenomenon where really interaction is a statistical phenomenon, but you'll see them used uh, interchangeably. And finally, effect modification is very important to help define high-risk subgroups. And really, it's the way you're supposed to do a subgroup analysis. And you really need to consider what could be a potential effect modifiers during the design of a study, because you need to power your study to have enough patients who have those um, individual um, levels of your potential effect modifiers so that you actually can analyze it in the um, analysis phase of your study. And also, we, we deal with confounding very differently in a study because we're trying to avoid confounding. So we do randomization and matching or restriction. It's important that we really don't match or restrict on a potential effect modifier because it will mask its uh, presence. Randomization is okay, uh, but you can't do matching or restriction. So I want to go through two ways, depending on who you are, if you can determine whether something is an effect modifier, effect modifier or a confounder. So first, for researchers, you're going to need to take three steps to figure out if a variable is an effect modifier or not. So first thing you can do is you're going to calculate a crude measure of effect. Then you're going to calculate a measure of effect for each stratum of however you break up your effect modifier. And then finally, you're going to test if the stratum-specific measure of effect are similar, and there's a couple of different ways you can do this. If they're not similar, then you have effect modification, and what you should report is the stratum-specific measures of effect. If they are similar, the stratum-specific measure of effect, then what you need to do is compare your crude and your adjusted measures of effect. And if they differ from each other by more than 10%, then you have confounding, and you should report your adjusted measure of effect. If they're the same or differ by less than 10%, then you have neither confounding or effect modification, and you can report your crude or adjusted measure of effect. Now, for readers of research papers, you're not going to be doing these analyses, but what you're going to need to do is look at tables or look at the data presented in the study and figure out if something is an effect modifier or not. So something will be an effect modifier 
if the crude measure of effect, the odds ratio relative risk, is within the range of all the stratum specific odds ratios or relative risk. In a sense, it looks like an average of all these stratum specific odds ratios or relative risks. A confounder, on the other hand, its crude odds ratio or relative risk will be outside of the range of the stratum, stratum specific odds ratios or relative risk. It won't look like an average. And you also, as we pointed out on the previous slide, the adjusted odds ratio or relative risk will differ by more than 10% than the crude odds ratio or relative risk. Now you're probably going to have to calculate the crude odds ratio or relative risk because they're often not given in a paper. And I have two videos that go through how to do this and I recommend you watch those if you don't know how to calculate an odds ratio or a relative risk. So let's put this to practice and see if this makes sense actually looking at that same table. So first let's focus on the association of rheumatoid arthritis with herpes and look at these different age specific strata. So if you just eyeball these they look pretty similar. And also you can see the statistical test for telling us whether these are different was not statistically significant. So these are similar to each other. Now, because they're similar to each other, they're not an effect modifier. So now we want to compare our crude odds ratio and our adjusted odds ratio. And we need to see if they differ by more than 10%. You can see here they don't differ by more than 10%. Therefore, the age is neither a confounder or an effect modifier of the association between rheumatoid arthritis and herpes zoster. Well, what about lupus? Well, when you eyeball these, you can see they're, the stratum-specific measures of effect are very different. Also, the statistical test tells us they're different. So therefore, in this case, age is an effect modifier of the association between lupus and herpes zoster. I also mentioned you should look at the crude odds ratio. And you can see it falls within this stratum-specific odds ratio. This is almost like it's an average of these. So that, again, sort of tells you it's an effect modifier. So to close, Confounding is something we really try to avoid in a study because it distorts the true effect of exposure and disease. So we try to do things like matching, uh, randomization, restriction, things like that to avoid confounding. But effect modification, we want to look for it and report it because it could tell us that there are differential effects of our exposure or our treatment in certain subgroups of people. And finally, I think the Fletchers make a great point in their excellent textbook, Clinical Epidemiology of the Essentials, that a given variable can be a confounder. It could be an effect modifier. It could be both or neither, depending on our question we're trying to research or the data that we're looking at. I hope this video has helped you differentiate an effect modifier from a confounder. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.